Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. Following me and sharing my videos is really important. I'm a one-man shop with absolutely no money for advertising or much of anything else, so social media is in fact the way that I grow. So please, follow me on Twitter, at SYLTales, and any other social media. I'm on every social media known to man, some that probably you've never heard of, and you can find them on my channel's About page. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Well, I can give you a bit of a non-spoiler review on this. Um, I kind of enjoyed this episode. It's one of the few times that didn't drift into irritating SJW identity politics. It didn't repeatedly smack you across the head with a two-by-four to make sure that you got the moral of the story. It was well executed in virtually every respect. My only issue was that because there were so many South Yorkshire dialects in use, it was actually very hard for me as an American to follow. Now, I usually do watch a show at least twice. The first time I watch it to see if I enjoy it, just kind of sit back and watch it as a viewer. And the second time I do it with a more critical eye. And to me, this second viewing was just absolutely necessary so I can guide all the dialogue. But it was a uh, generally good episode, one of the best in the Chibnall era. And why is that? Well, to begin with, there no, were no identity politics at play, at least not anything obvious. And secondly, and most importantly, we got a bit of character development for the companions, something that has been completely missing from the Chibnall era. Unfortunately, we are still waiting for the various arcs that they've set up to play out. With other Doctor actors, we've seen season-long arcs in which each episode tends to be one and done. That is, it's not really related to the next episode of the one that came before it, but it does contribute something, no matter how small, to a season-long arc. And then that season-long arc is usually wrapped up in a big old two-parter that people tend to remember. I challenge you to remember anything so far that this doctor's done that's really extraordinary. The season arcs then tend to become overall doctor arcs that are then resolved when that doctor regenerates. Now, with this season, Chibnall has set up at least three different arcs, or perhaps only one. Maybe they're all tied together. We don't know. And unfortunately, he's just saving that for episodes 9 and 10. We won't see any further development of them in episode 8, and we only saw a tiny fraction of one as a sort of an Easter egg uh, in this episode. We still have none of all of that, but at least we do have some character development, and maybe my standards are getting low, but when I see character development in this show, I go, oh, good, we finally got something. So my non-spoiler review is that it is a good episode and one of the best of the Chibnall era so far. However, since you came to this video looking for a review, I assume that you've already watched Doctor Who Season 12, Episode 6, Can You Hear Me? But nevertheless, for safety's sake, we should probably issue a... Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers! Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a fandai master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. And this is neither a boast nor a brag. This is just where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years' worth of science fiction. The problem with fandai masters is that we are cursed. We find that nothing is new or original. You just can't see the new stuff for the whole century that came before. And it kind of interferes with your ability to enjoy things sometimes. So, I usually try to start out with any given episode, or any given movie, anything I'm reviewing, by trying to say something nice about the episode. And frankly, I have a lot of nice things to say about this one. The first were the Easter eggs. The Eternals that were mentioned. These are a fifth Doctor race of immortals who played interesting games with sailing ships in space. And I have a link to those guys in the description box. They mentioned the Guardians, that would be the white and black Guardians of Time, and they were a pair of immortals from the 4th and 5th Doctor's eras who um, 
ha- apparently had some great control over time itself. I have a link to those guys in my description box. In fact, the entirety of season 16 of Classic Who was called The Key to Time, and it involved the fourth Doctor and the first Romana looking for a fragment of the object that is the key to time that they were then going to turn over to the White Guardian at his, well, sort of explicit order. And I have a link to that whole season arc in my description box below. They mentioned the Toy Maker. This was a first Doctor Immortal who made um, people play childish games um, with their freedom at stake. And the games were always, of course, rigged in his favor. And again, I have a link to that guy in my description box below. So some nice Easter eggs that we got to see here. Other general things, there were some great moments in this one, some of what I'll talk about specifically when it comes to acting, direction, and cinematography, etc., etc., But working through these companions' fears finally, finally gives us some insight into them. And, uh, you know, they gave some character development. And I very much enjoyed that. It is really the first time in coming up on two years that we finally get to see some character development. Sadly, I suspect that this will be a complete one-off. The companions, particularly Raz and Jazz and Ryan, seem to be contemplating leaving the Doctor. I'm actually okay with that. Three companions is really too many when you don't have, you just don't have time for character development, particularly when you've only got 10 episodes. You know, if you take four people, divide that by 10 episodes, you just don't have that much time to devote to any particular companion. To be honest, one companion is probably best. Now, you can get away with two if they're basically joined at the hip, the way that Amy and Rory were, and their character development feeds off of each other. But I say keep Graham. He's certainly my favorite of the three. This may be because he's similar in age to me. Maybe. I don't know. But I find him the most personable, the one that I can relate to more, the one who is uh, usually got his head on straight. And he's a person that, see, the problem with the female, with the doctor being a woman, is that throughout almost all of human history, right up until the beginning of the 20th century, really, women were considered second-class citizens. And if a woman spoke out of turn, then she would be slapped down good and hard. And the problem with this is the doctor going back in time to any time before the 20th century, she is going to be a second-class citizen. And so she needs a front man, a male, to essentially be the guy who stands there and listens to what everybody says while the doctor is listening at the same time and then doing whatever the hell the doctor says to do. (laughs) And uh, by the way, um, shouldn't there be some sort of Time Lord technology that will completely cure Graham of the possibility of cancer? I mean, that certainly would seem to be a tech that's within the Time Lord's reach. The lie of the Timeless Child arc tie-in is good, even though it's only a couple of seconds of it. And I assume that this is going to pay off in episodes 9 and 10. Um, What this appears... This appears uh, to be Gallifrey, the two or three seconds we see in its very early history. And I have some idea of where this headed, but uh, I won't want to spoil it for you. I think um, it involves some level of implementation of what Huvians call the Cartmel Master Plan. And if you want to find out about that, there's a link to it below. But be aware that if you read about it, you may very well be spoiled for the remainder of the uh, series. I very much enjoy these immortals. Now, humans really just can't wrap their head around something in terms of living forever. You have ample time to master every single skill that ever was or ever will be. What do you do after that? Well, maybe you spend a few hundred millennia being a benevolent god. Maybe you spend the next few hundred millennia being a vengeful god. Maybe you screw around with the lives of mortals just because, from your perspective, they're gone in the flash of an eye anyway, and they just don't matter. Doctor Who has occasionally touched on this within the Doctor herself. She is nigh immortal. Um, In fact, after her Matt Smith to Peter Capaldi regeneration, she might just be plain immortal herself. When the 24th or 25th Doctor rolls around, I doubt that the producers are going to pay any lip service whatsoever to the 12 regenerations rule. It would just be stupid to do. It puts you in a bad position if you can't just keep regenerating the Doctor. So I think they'll just do that, and they won't pay any attention to the other stuff. In any case, the Doctor has always and will always lose her companions. 
Some will leave of their own accord, some will be left behind, and some will die. Matt Smith talked about this, his need for companionship just to keep his own perspective. He said if the, the, the entire universe is your backyard, then it gets boring after a while. You need a wide-eyed ephemeral type in order to keep your perspective. I mean, not to mention the dramatic purpose that a companion serves, which is the doctor knows what's going on, but by telling the companion, then we, the audience, knows what's going on. <laughs> Now, um, in uh, any case, I like how these immortals are played. I can imagine them being real. I mean, after billions of years, you just start screwing around with the mortals because why not? And then I have my cringe moments. Uh, I sort of mentioned a couple of sort of cringe moments at the, when I was talking about the good moments. But to be honest, uh, I'm not really sure that I have any real cringe moments here. The immortals are great. The character development was good. It didn't wander into the um, incredible cesspool of identity politics and hitting us across the head with a two-by-four just to hammer home the show's message. So generally, I'd say well done all the way around. Now, as always, I try to start out with the writing, not the acting, because without a script, you have nothing to shoot. Everything dramatic, good or bad, is ultimately the fault of the writers. The writers in this case are Chris Chibnall and Charlene James. Well, Chris Chibnall is a confirmed hack fraud. Enough said. Charlene James has been active from 2016 to present with six writing credits, two of which for episodes of A Discovery of Witches. She has won no awards. I'm going to attribute most of the writing here to Charlene James precisely because we didn't wander into the stinking cesspool of identity politics nor hitting us across the head with a two-by-four to hammer home the show's message. We got some science fiction. We got some wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. We got an exploration of immortality, and we got some Easter eggs. This was just generally good writing all the way around, something Chris Chibnall is incapable of doing. In terms of the acting, well, of course, Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. Good performance here. For once, for once, and it happens so, in, so infrequently, her talents were not underutilized. Now, I've said this before. I will probably say it again as long as Jodie Whittaker is playing the Doctor. Jodie Whittaker is a beautiful woman. And after 10 years of listening to fangirls squee at the doctor, I take some smug delight that it is finally my turn. Oh, sure, she's not the same age as I am. I'm older than her. But still, she's old enough that it's not creepy if I say, man, she's hot. However, I don't for find her particularly sexy, except when she's given something interesting and or intelligent to do. That's just me. I don't get off on stupid girls. You will never watch me. I'll never watch a Kardashian. I mean, yeah, they're attractive, but boy, are they stupid, and I want nothing to do with them. Smart girls make it for me. So when she's given something interesting or intelligent to do, um, and you know, oftentimes she's practically giving the audience the moral of the story in shots that do everything except have her looking straight at the camera to tell you it, but in this here, she's used intelligently, and damn, is she sexy. So take that, fangirls. Graham, of course, played by um, Bradley Walsh. He is always my favorite of the companions, and he has been from the beginning. And again, this may just be his relative nearness to my age. I don't know. But his character development here of being scared that his cancer will return is the most adult fear of any of the companions. I love it when the things that they have to deal with are a little bit more adult. Uh, this, uh, this, the other things that we see here are things that I may have experienced at some point, but they're so far into my past that I really don't find them engaging very much. So, as always, uh, he gives a great performance. Ryan, played by Tozen Cole, again, his character development in terms of his fear of missing out on the real world is constantly, by constantly traveling with the Doctor, is great. It's not as adult for me as Graham's is, but it is perfectly valid. He will, in fact, return to the real world as a completely different person than when he left. He already is, in many ways, a very different person. His wondering if this is going to be his life, if just going with the doctor is going to be how it goes, is pretty well done. Uh, 
So I think we've got to find performance, something we rarely see from Tosin Cole because the scripts tend to demand very little from the companions. They're mostly information dumps. And Amanda Gill as Yaz. Again, the character development we're given here is very good. Her late adolescent depression combined with a fear of being alone gives us a very nice uh, insight into her character that we have never seen before. However, and this is the writing and not her performance, one would have to think a little bit about the practicalities of this. She's a fledgling police constable. Her returning to real life is going to be a little problematic. If she returns to just after she left, well, then she's going to be years older, probably noticeably, and have a lot more experience under her belt than when she left. She's going to look very different to the other police uh, officers. But if she returns at the same time as the other companions, you know, uh, goes along and experiences some level of time, you have to wonder, is she even going to have a job as a police constable after so many multiple absences? I mean, most police forces don't like it if you're gone as long as she often is. Still, she gives a good performance, something, again, that the scripts rarely give her a chance to do when she's a glorified errand girl or exposition dump for the doctor. Uh, Alan Gully. Galivia, who plays Tahira, well, she's not got a lot of here for her to do, aside from being scared and amazed, but she does perform it well. Uh, Claire Hope Ashety as Rakaya, again, not a hell of a lot to do here, except appear very malevolent, but she plays it well. Ian Gelder as Zelen, uh, he is, again, mostly an exposition dump, but he plays it very, very creepy. Um, his references to other immortals, those Easter eggs that I talk about, it makes it even creepier if you know what he was referencing. Boam Tinghai Gang, uh, who played uh, Tebo, uh, good one here. He plays a character suffering from depression and anxiety. And for reasons that I'm not going to go into, I identify with this quite a lot. I think it was a great job of performing it. I think he did that well. I would mention, however, that from a purely therapeutic perspective, group therapy isn't necessarily the best way to go for that. It's usually some combination of medications to relieve the immediate stress and problems, and then psychotherapy. Getting into the mechanics of making the film, the director was Emma Sullivan. Um, she has been active 2004 to, to present. She has 13 director credits. She is slated for next week's episode. None. Uh, she's none, done no real significant work that we call in genre. That is science fiction, fantasy, superheroes, etc. Uh, and she has done multiple episodes of multiple series. She also has three writer credits, but these are all for things that she also directed. Her direction is quite good. I can't point to anything that jumped out at me as really amazing, but it was well done and it was perfectly appropriate. Cinematography is by Ed Moore. He was cinematography uh, on Spy Fall Part 2, Orphan 55, and is scheduled for the next episode. Now, I said this before, I'll say it again. You, if you're a regular viewer, you hear this in damn near every episode. That's the director's job is to say, I want to get these shots. The cinematographer's job is to say, yes, I can get you those shots. Now, you tend to kind of hope that there is some level of collaboration between them. I always point to Superman, the movie from 1978, uh, which I have reviewed in a lengthy review and live stream, as a good example of when you had a really good collaboration. Because what happens is the director says, I want this shot. The cinematogra cinematographer says, okay, I can get you that. But what if we did it just slightly differently here? What if we lit this differently? What if we had a slightly different camera angle and we take advantage of some of the stuff that's in our environment? And the director might listen to that and say, oh, you know, that's a good idea. Let's, let's do that. Let's go for that. So you get this back and forth. Now, I have no idea if that's happening here. You'd have to be sitting on you know, the set to know, you know behind the scenes. But whatever's going on, it certainly does work. Um, every, all the shots are good. They're lit well. Um, they make a dramatic impact where they're supposed to, and it all works very well. Production designer is David Schumer. He has done a number of uh, episodes of Doctor Who, all of one of which was in the Chibnall era, and he was last used in season 11 in Kerblam. I found the sets and general production design 
were pretty good. Um, ancient Syria was totally appropriate, as was the spacecraft, etc. There aren't actually that many sets that we've not seen before, but the ones that we do are perfectly fine. I wouldn't call anything particularly inspired, but they were certainly appropriate to the era, appropriate to what was going on. Music again by Sagun Akinola. It was fine. The credits list a mixer as well, so I kind of have to assume that he, they're using cues that he already created. Now, this is not unusual for TV. You do not have an unlimited budget for music, so you tend to reuse and mix existing cues together in order to fit the action. Well, there was nothing that was wrong here. I can always tell when something's wrong. I'm a huge audiophile. I have over 400 soundtracks in my collection. But by the same token, nothing really stood out. And that generally has been a hallmark of Akinola's music. It works, but it's just not very memorable. Really, the only memorable thing about it is the opening titles. That's, that's the main memorable music. The special effects supervisor was Sheila Wickens. As always, <laughs> she's just a supervisor. The effects are in army in multiple houses, and you have no idea what to credit to whom. Where there were what must have been special effects, they were perfectly com competent. If you want incompetent special effects, watch my reviews of Batwoman, where the special effects tend to look like something you could have done on my computer. <laughs> Where the special effects and green screens were used that weren't obvious, they were perfectly integrated in such a way that you didn't know. I mean, a lot of times they use a green screen just for a window that's, you know, in the character's background because they can't actually put something up that's, you know, medieval England, so they put a green screen over it and put something in. So whatever was going on there was a good job all around. The costume and prosthetic design was by Ray Holman. Okay say this before, say it again, probably say it in every episode. If you're a regular viewer, you are probably going to get tired of it. But a costume should always tell you something about the character. So, for example, if you saw me on the street, I would be wearing a geeky t-shirt. Today it was a NASA t-shirt and jeans. And that would tell you something about who I am, kind of a geek. And when I'm on the show, I am making a very conscious decision about this as a costume. Because nobody dresses like this anywhere that I've ever lived in what the coasts of the United States insultingly call flyover country or rural America, which isn't very rural, actually. But it's a, it's a total costume. You know, nobody dresses in this stuff. I'm wearing this vest and my white shirt and my bolo tie and my Indiana Jones hat because I want to push my brand that I am a relatively folksy guy who uh, talks about reviews from places that you don't ordinarily get reviews from physically, and at the same time, kind of, you know, Nebraska represent, uh, telling you that we're not just a bunch of stupid bumpkins with, uh, you know, a, uh, a piece of uh, grass hanging out of our mouths. So the costumes we see here on the Companions are totally appropriate. They tend to be very similar or the same from episode to episode, but that choice itself, again, tells you something about the character. My clothes might not be identical from day to day, but I will be jeans and some level of geeky t-shirt. It's just what I wear. The antagonists were kind of interesting, inasmuch as they were near mirrors of each other. One was black and the other was all white. One does have to wonder if that wasn't a slight wander into identity politics inasmuch as the white guy wore the black costume and the black girl wore the white one. Still, it worked. The choice of the white color for the one of the two that was had more power. And again, it was a woman. One has to wonder. But that was definitely intentional and it was interesting and it worked. The makeup designer is Claire Pritchard Jones. And as always, the makeup here is good. It works well in 1080p, which is actually a hell of a lot more harder than you think that it is. Making makeup look good in 1080p is, if you've got anybody with the slightest skin imperfection, is really tough. It'll tend to look really caked on. Never saw that here. Good work, uh, 1080p. Yay for you. So at the end of any given episode, we might ask, is it any good? Well, yes, this is a good episode. It is not a brilliant episode, but it is one of the two, one of the two, two or few best so far in this dismal Chibnall era. For once, I didn't have endless cringe moments, which is pretty unusual for Chibnall era who.
Hopefully, if Doctor Who lasts into another season, Chibnall will hire <laughs> Charlene uh, James to do some more scripts. So yes, this was a good episode, and I can recommend that you watch it. And that is all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So, next time on the Fandai Master's Review of Doctor Who, the Doctor finds herself at Via Diotati in 1816 on the night that inspired Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. The plan was to spend the evening in the presence of literary greats, but the ghosts are all too real. Now the Doctor is forced into an earth-shattering decision. That's next time on the Fandai Master's Review of Doctor Who. So, thanks for watching. That is all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.